So if you follow my channel, I do a lot of commentary on the uh, Ukraine war, and uh, I've been glued to the television for three days. <laughs> the fact that I haven't left my house. And, uh, man, I tell you, I've watched every video, every Russian television uh, news uh, report and everything. And I just wanted to give you my uh, synopsis of what, uh, how different scenarios that I think has gone on, because it's pretty much over at this point. So, um, the first uh, scenario that I've heard a lot of people talk about was that Prigozhny is losing his mind. He's been in the war too long. He's got PTSD. He's gone insane, and uh, somehow, and this is the part that reason why I don't think that theory is correct, is that somehow he got 25,000 soldiers to follow him in what uh, the Western media will display as a coup attempt. Um, I don't think that 25,000 soldiers would follow a man that they consider to be somewhat mentally uh, disabled. Let's just put it that way. So... The fact that the soldiers followed him in this uh, massive uh, redeployment, let's just say the Wagner, if you're not familiar with the Wagner organization, those are the Russian mercenaries that uh, basically just wiped all the Ukrainians out of Bakhmut. Uh, so Andy Amos now is, is what it's called by the Russians since they own it. Uh, so that's the, that's the first scenario, and I think that is the very much least likely. Uh, the second scenario, which is possible because of the things that Prigozhny said, is that the West uh, got a hold to him through uh, Ukrainian operatives and probably offered him a lot of money. And they had uh, hopefully had the Russian paramilitaries uh, ready to go. They had uh, they promised Prigozhny that they had lined up support within within Russia for a coup. And uh, and so they, they captured him that way, and, but even that scenario seems unlikely because once again, once he got to, uh, gosh, I can't remember the name of the town, it was in the southern, you, know, you can watch it on other videos, uh, he, he took over where the Russian ministry was conducting the war, uh, basically his troops occupied that town, and uh, and then when he got there, he said, you know, he basically spewed the all the Western nonsense that we get from the mainstream media that uh, Ukraine was winning the war. You know, they're coming across. The counteroffensive has been successful. Uh, the Russian military command is a bunch of idiots and uh, all of that stuff. And yet, if he thought that and his troops thought that, why would you follow him? Uh, well, I guess in a coup, I guess it's possible, but I, I don't see where that would be that big a deal. And also, you have to understand that the Russian military command wanted the Wagner soldiers, their, their private military group, to sign uh, contracts, basically uh, turning them over to the Russian military. And if you've ever uh, been in battle or, uh, or been part of an organization, well, just a soccer team, for example, or a football team, you know, you get that camaraderie. And so the, uh, the Wagners... I mean, especially when you fight in war, you wouldn't believe what you'll do to save your your uh, your platoon or your your men. I mean, extraordinary acts acts of valor have occurred in in many locations. I've seen them myself in war, and I uh, and so that could explain why a lot of the soldiers, when they were forced into being forced into these contracts to basically give up their title as Wagner, uh, that uh, I'm die. You know, well, if you want to say mentally disabled, man, as a lot of people want to believe, but that's how you could get 25,000 soldiers to follow you because they don't want to sign the contracts. Uh, they love Russia, but they, you know, they're, they're going to follow this guy as, and hopefully he's got a plan or, or maybe not. So that's, the, that's kind of the, the second scenario. Um, I'm going to get to the ones that I think is what happened. Um, because of what I saw, okay, the first thing that, that was bizarre, okay, about this whole thing was the the Wagner forces came up a bunch of main roads. They actually, they, it was a master plan if you want to think they were going to actually take over, try to take over Moscow. There's no way that was ever going to happen. But uh, they came up uh, three different routes of attack onto uh, Moscow, or so it appeared. 
Uh, they divided their forces so that they couldn't be hit. But the, the things that, that I found strange in this whole operation, and this is why I think this is 4D chess, there was no panic. Uh, in Moscow, people were just going about their business. Yeah, they kind of declared martial law, but, you know, and they put up some roadblocks and stuff. Uh, and there were military vehicles on the streets, uh, but it wasn't a big deal. I mean, most everybody was just going, well, you know. So what if 25,000 men with lots of military equipment and fully armed are marching on Moscow? We're not going to worry about it. The other thing was the uh, the southern city where they first hit. I wish I'd written down the name of it. I'm sorry. Uh, where they where the Russian ministry was located. Even those people were still out on the streets, just kind of shrugging off. So there was no there's no bullets firing. I mean, if you if you really thought a coup of twenty five of an army of twenty five thousand men was coming to uh, overthrow your government, which you know, most people say, well, it wasn't about Putin. It was about the Russian ministry. Uh, he was going after, uh, what's their names? Shogu and Grashmov. And uh, those are the military uh, high commanders uh, basically conducting the war. And uh, it's certainly uh, Prigozhin has been very vocal about his animosity towards these two individuals and uh, and his, you know, his lack of ammunition, uh, they're, they're, and well, of course, what kicked it all off was they said that supposedly uh, Shogru and, and Grashnov uh, ordered a military strike on the Wagner uh, camps that were had been pulled back from from the front lines, and they were just basically chilling out. And uh, so the fact that they would try to kill their own uh, paramilitary force uh, doesn't make any sense. They've certainly denied it. Uh, of course, uh, Prigozhin said that they did. So you can see how this all gets really convoluted and confusing, and I'm going to wrap this all up here in just a minute. So let me, um, so let me get to the, uh, let's see if there's any more that I want to go into the, the rest of the story and what I really, really, really think is going on. So, uh, yeah, so let's get to the fourth story that uh, this is what I really think just took place. And if it is true, I think this was a masterful plan for a redeployment of uh, military resources that that basically enticed the West into giving up some of its plans because they came out and said they want to attack Belarus. Uh, that was something that, you know, wasn't known before this whole thing took place. Uh, the other thing was I, the Ukrainians, from what I understand, have committed to another uh, frontal attack on the Russian defenses, which is what the Russians want. They want those Ukrainians attacking their defensive lines so that they can wipe them out because those defensive lines are impenetrable. And also the other thing that, that the reason why I think the fourth scenario is the most likely, there was no redeployment. You had the Chesnians, uh, they were moved out to counter the Wagner forces supposedly. And, and there might have been some staged video, a couple of helicopters got blown out of the air, but Understand a column moving along a highway. I mean, look at the death uh, in, in Iraq that we uh, leveled up on the Iraqis. You know, when, when they found those columns moving along the highway, they destroyed everything the Iraqis had. So the, this Wagner column moving along the highway could have been destroyed at any time. So the fact that they didn't do it tells me this is 4D chess. So what I think is that they wanted to move the Wagner troops and... They did it in such a way as, you know, and I bet, I bet the West was trying to get Prigozhin to come over. So they kind of used that as a ruse. That's my opinion. And they used it to redeploy the Wagner troops out of the, um, the uh, Ukrainian, well, Russian territory now, uh, the Donbass region. They brought them in. They brought them all the way up the highway, and then they brought them into Bel Bel Belregard. That's the uh, that's the city or the area of Russia that the Ukrainian uh, forces have been attacking, and so they they've re uh, uh, redeployed their forces to there. Also, uh, supposedly, um, if you want to believe this, the Belarus uh, commander, uh, boy, I tell you, I know I'm getting a really <laughs> <laughs> really long-winded with this. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Lazarov? No, not Lazarov. That's the Russian ambassador. Boy, I tell you, keeping up with all this is uh, it's, it's something else. Lashenko. Yeah. So at the last minute when the Wagner forces were 200 kilometers from uh, the Russian or Moscow, 
Uh, supposedly, Lazarov and um, Prigozhin had a big conversation, and somehow he convinced Prigozhin to uh, call off the attack on Moscow and come to uh, Belarus, which they haven't gone to Belarus. They've actually gone to Belgrade uh, and reinforced that area. And I'm there. if you look at the battle plans, what I'm seeing is now we're going to have an attack of the Wagner forces, because the Wagner forces are well rested now. They've been out of Bakhmut for, well, a month or two. When was it that they actually, uh, uh, well, the Russian troops actually relieved them. So it's been about a month and a half. So they've had plenty of time to rest up and get ready. And so what they're going to do is they're going to kind of come in from the north. And of course, the Ukrainians are attacking. This is where the main attack is taking place, right around Bakhmut. So if they come in from the north, they're going to be hitting them once again, in a, in, a, in a cauldron, they're going to try to get them into a cauldron and, and just annihilate those Ukrainian forces. So if this is what's going on, I think it's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant move by the Russians. And, of course, I, from what I understand, some of the um, uh, uh, Wagner forces are going to be going to uh, uh, Belarus uh, to reinforce them because it looks like the Ukrainians are going to be attacking there. So that, that's going to get them reinforced. So that's another uh, aspect of the puzzle. So that's, that's going to be good for the war for the, um, the Russians. So I can kind of see, I, you know, from, from all of the questions that I had as to why they didn't destroy the column, if this was really uh, what they were trying to do, why, why Prigozhin has been so belligerent. And by the way, that's another thing that's uh, weird about this whole thing is that Prigozhin, According to uh, what I'm seeing, they just said, okay, yeah, you can keep your Wagner forces. Just just go to Belgrade and, and you know, sit there for a while. No, no. I, if, you, if you actually committed these types of things, you'd be a dead man walking. Now, I, now, maybe he will be assassinated. Maybe I'm completely wrong about all of this. It is possible. The other thing of the 4D chess that I see taking place is now the uh, Western media and especially the neocon uh, uniparty that we have here in the United States, the warmongering Democrats, and of course the uh, people like Lindsey Graham and uh, Mitt Romney, they're going to commit everything we got because they see they see this as turmoil in Russia. So now they think Russia's on the ropes. Well, Russia's and China are playing the long game, and they just see this. They they don't see us uh, managing this thing. They're, they're, we've expended so much military hardware in this war; it's unbelievable. And so what they want us to do is commit even more hardware. So, uh, and we can't replenish it the way that the Russians can. So you've got another aspect to the game is they want us spending more money on the war and they want us putting more weapons in, okay? Because the Russia's ready for them. They can destroy them. They can take them out. You know, I've, I've sent, put up many videos showing the Russian military equipment. They've got the best air defenses in the world. Uh, they got the most modern nuclear forces in the world, so they're not scared of the West. They want the West to commit these resources to Ukraine. They want to fight them on the battlefield in Ukraine so that they don't have to go no place else. I mean, you don't want to go into a hostile area like Poland or Lithuania or Germany or whatever, and, you know, and then you're going to turn the people against it and, you know, things are going to advance slowly. No, they just want to take everything, all of NATO's hardware all the United States are where they just want to take it out in Ukraine. So now we're going to commit even more money, more military forces to the war. So another reason why I said it's 4D chess. That's what I think has just taken place. So anyway, uh, I want to see if there's anything else in these notes that I want to talk about. Oh, yeah, of course, 85% of the world. The first, imagine the first country that called uh, Russia... Because, you know, no, the rest of the world, of course, doesn't know what's going on. But, you know, they're, they're, they're lining up behind Russia and China, for sure. 85% of the world's against the United States at this point. So the first Turkey to call, uh, first country to call, well, I gave it away, Turkey. Uh, and uh, he called up Elrond and said, uh, hey, we're still behind you, Putin. Uh, we, we're, we've got your back. So isn't that very interesting that a NATO country actually called Russia and said, uh, don't, don't. Don't worry, uh, if you're really having a military coup, uh, we've, we've got your, uh, your back. So, you know, it wasn't a coup for sure. I can guarantee you that. Perhaps it was a mutiny. I, like I said, I don't think so. I think this was 4D chess. I think this was a redeployment of forces with a hell of a lot of confusion. It only took less than 48 hours to get this all accomplished, have the eyes of the world on all of this, and 
achieve all of their military objectives in a short period of time under the cloak of a massive PSYOP. That's the way I look at this. This was a massive Russian PSYOP. Just like, see, they're learning. You know, the United States, they conducted the COVID PSYOP on the American people and everybody went for it. They conducted the, uh, all kinds of PSYOPs. Well, we just had the PSYOP with the submarine. You know, so, so Russia, they, they know the game now. And so they I think this was a massive PSYOP. Peace out, stay free, and it's good, 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 good to live in the free, free, free Republican state of Florida. Leave a comment below. Tell me what you think of all my analysis.